Welcome to the second episode of our Knowledge Exchange series, How Legal Professionals Can Promote Access to Justice for LGBTQI and 2S People. This is geared to legal professionals working with legal aid clients and their communities. The Law Society of Ontario has accredited this episode for an hour and 15 minutes of EDI professionalism for your CPD. In this series, we'll be chatting with experts from across Canada to share best practices and challenges regarding how to serve LGBTQI2S clients and their communities. Our guest speakers bring experiences from legal aid clinics, tribunals, courts, human rights commissions, and frontline community organizations. Over our six episodes, our discussions cover a variety of topics that identify concepts, point out barriers and structures that perpetuate the social and legal marginalization of LGBTQI2S people. And of course, we talk about practical solutions and approaches. Make sure to watch episode one, if you haven't already, where we talked about how sex and gender are embedded in law, and we talked about homophobia and transphobia in law and legal culture. It's available at egal.ca, as well as on our YouTube channel. And again, we welcome having feedback and questions from you in between episodes so that we can come back and address questions that you may have that you have for us. And you can do that by emailing us at legal at egal.ca. Today, we're talking about practical approaches to client-centered and trauma-informed legal services. This is so incredibly relevant for all lawyers, but in particular, people who are working in the clinical setting because of the nature of who is coming for legal services, legal information, and so many other things. As we know, it's uh, a diverse number of requests that legal clinicians get in the clinic system. And so I, before I introduce our guest, uh, I'm going to talk I'm going to introduce us with a quote from a brand new book that came out in 2020 by Trevor C.W. Farrow and Leslie A. Jacobs. It's called The Justice Crisis, The Cost and Value of Accessing Law. Less than 7% of people use courts to resolve their problems and less than 20% get legal advice. Access to justice costs and barriers are higher and more complex for domestic violence survivors. And within Indigenous communities, the justice system has re-traumatized and re-victimized some, partially in the context of Indian residential school litigation. And if you remember at the beginning of episode one, I was talking about the transforming justice study from Ontario 2016 in which we talked about how out of 71% of uh, participants, these were trans participants of the survey in Ontario, 71% had a justiciable issue, 69% felt that they needed legal representation for that justiciable issue, and only 7% actually were able to secure professional legal services. So you can see that intersectionally access to justice is huge for members of communities that have experienced trauma and then are trying to actually address um, a problem that might be a legal problem. So I'm going to introduce our first guest. Myrna McCallum is a Métis Cree mother and grandmother from Treaty 6 territory, Green Lake and Waterhen First Nation. She is the host of the Trauma Informed Lawyer podcast, Myrna acknowledges that it is Indigenous people and survivors of sexual violence who transformed her into the trauma-informed lawyer she is today. Myrna educates via her podcast on trauma-informed lawyering, cultural humility, vicarious trauma and resilience, and Indigenous intergenerational trauma. She also educates through keynotes, training sessions, and lunch and learn lectures. Myrna also offers one-on-one -on -one customized trauma-informed lawyering training and coaching sessions for legal professionals. Myrna practices human rights law, criminal law, and conducts workplace investigations into sexual misconduct, human rights, bullying, and harassment complaints. Welcome to our episode. 
uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Before we get into maybe having this conversation, can I just say a couple of things? One is, first off, I live and work on the uh, traditional and unceded ancestral territory of the Squamish, Slave, and the Musqueam people. And that's where I am videoing in from today. And secondly, I want to be really clear that my background is solely in law. Like I'm just a lawyer. That's all I am. All of my education in trauma and resilience has really come from survivors of sexual violence. Uh, and more specifically, Indigenous survivors. And so it's to them that my hands go up because everything that I teach is really the teachings that they gave me, the education that they gave me. So it's important that I note that. Thank you so much. And I will also note that I, too, I'm, I'm not trained in a mental health profession, but trained as a lawyer and have worked in countless community organizations with a particular focus on um, ending and eradicating gender-based violence and with a particular focus on LGBTQSI uh, and 2S communities. So we're bringing a lot of um, experience and knowledge, but also naming what um, we don't know, which is so important, especially for lawyers who don't like to say what they don't know. Um, so, so Myrna, there is this incredible toolkit that you took part in creating with a number of other lawyers, mental health practitioners, and law students uh, um, created by the Golden Eagle Rising Society that we're going to talk about today. And the toolkit is incredible, and I, I hope that everybody goes to the website for the Golden Eagle Rising um, Society and takes a look and downloads that toolkit and takes a look at it. It covers so such a wide breadth of really critical and practical tools. And I'm wondering if you can start by telling us why, like what is trauma and how is it relevant to the work of legal service professionals? Um, well, thank you for that question. What is trauma? So as I have come to learn, trauma is really, I think, best described by Bessel van der Kolk, who is this renowned trauma expert. Everybody quotes Bessel. And so Bessel has this quote about how to people who are reliving uh, a trauma, they seem to be trapped in like this life or death kind of situation. And they struggle to regulate. They're very reactive. They become easily agitated. Um, their emotions are just very extreme. And I really, like I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I really love that definition. Why? Because that resonates with something I've seen many times in the courtroom, in the hearing room, in interview rooms. I've seen it in opposing counsel. I've seen it in judges. I've seen it in myself. And mm. so that really, I thought, was kind of the, um, you know, the thing that connects us all. It, it really helped me realize that we're all carrying around some kind of trauma. Like, it could be the big traumas of life. It could be the little traumas. But we're all carrying something with us, and it shows up in our work. Right. So when you say... I'm thinking about examples of like a big trauma could be a sexual assault. It could be a lifetime. It could be repeated incidents like uh, being a child in a family where there's uh, consistent and constant abuse. So it's repeated. Um, it could also be something like witnessing a car accident or perhaps I know in my community, which is the Sri Lankan Tamil community, like experiencing a genocide and then you know, experiencing racism. So, or for indigenous people and two spirit people, ongoing settler colonialism. So those, would those be examples of trauma that our clients might be experiencing or we might be experiencing? Well, absolutely. So I'm really glad that you identified some of those because I think those are the common traumas that people would mm -hmm. think of when they think of trauma, these big life events, right? But how I... 
I would like to break it down is, yes, there are those big life events, like somebody close to us has died, a sexual assault has happened, maybe a home invasion. But there is also uh, another category of, I would say, folks experiencing trauma, and it's those who are witnessing these events. Sometimes they are more traumatized than the person who is directly experiencing the event. And so we need to make space for witnesses to trauma. And then there are others who experience these um what we would call like little t traumas, right? The your pet has died, your spouse has left you, you know, you're being bullied or harassed in the workplace. Those can also result in a traumatic experience. And you can have people experiencing small little traumas and they'll have like a big trauma uh, response. You can have someone experiencing a big trauma and they'll have a small trauma response. Right. It really just so, depends on that individual. Make yeah, and make I think the lesson to be learned here is make no assumptions. Make we should no not be make no assumptions about how people are experiencing trauma and do not um, minimize because we don't know until we ask questions. I mean, and this is really characteristic of, you know, the classic criminal defense lawyer who is questioning a sexual assault complainant about why they didn't go to the police right away, why they continue to speak to this person. It's perhaps, perhaps they understand trauma and they don't care because they think they're doing their job. But I mean, it is this, these, these patterns that law is built on, especially in criminal law, that trauma, trauma, pe people who have experienced a trauma should act a certain way. And people who don't act that way, then clearly are lying, or can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what I have come to know, just being a lawyer, not not uh, undertaking any specific study is that the ways that traumas impact the brain are very interesting. And often yeah. times I would say have, uh, in my experience as a former prosecutor, I was taught that when I see these um, pre presentations happening, I should immediately assume that these are indicators of deception. Never right. did anyone turn my mind to think, wait a second, these also might be indicators of trauma. So for example, the two sides of the brain stop working together in a coordinated way, which causes people to become confused. Or the brocus area of the brain, which makes, which allows you to speak, makes it really hard to tell your trauma story in detail, even just makes it hard to speak about it. Right. Um, you know, your, your, uh, cortex frontal lobes are impacted so you you are living in this extreme state kind of like what Bessel van der Kolk is talking about right you're just uh you're you're behaving as though you are under threat even though no no threat is present so really highly um just highly charged and there's like so like the other there's parts of your brain that are impacted that make it really difficult to learn and difficult to listen and difficult to retain memory. So when we're asked to recount something in a chronological way, our brain is not necessarily working that way. So it's almost impossible to do so. And I mean, now that you've mentioned what will be some like very common trauma response indicators in that list that you just gave, um, I can see so clearly how in an intake session with a new client or an interview or prepping for a hearing or prepping for a trial, how, and I'm sure lots of lawyers and paralegals have experienced this frustration where it seems like the client isn't trying or they're not paying attention. Or I know when I used to do criminal defense, sometimes I would think like, does this person not care? But it's because I'm not um, adjusting the strategy to, and I mean, the whole process itself is not uh, trauma empathetic or trauma compassionate um, or even accepting of it, but that we're trying to push clients into these systems and make them act certain ways because that's going to get the right legal outcome, which is not trauma informed legal practice. <laughs> No, absolutely not. I've, I'm the first to say to folks, the courts were never designed to be trauma informed, which is why people walk away um, uh, experiencing maybe even more trauma or victimization in the courtroom. And so 
you know, I have said, if this is the path you want to go, if this is what you're going to do, then what you need to do is make sure you have the supports in place to help you through this because it's going to be really, really challenging and you're going to need a lot of support. That's why I think it's important at the outset when we meet with clients, we ask them the simple question, what do you want versus yes. what do you need? Because some people might say, well, I want justice. Well, what's justice? right? It's different things to different people. And you might not get justice in a courtroom. Or they might say, I want healing. Well, I can tell you, you're not going to get healing in a courtroom, right? And I, so I think by being transparent and being open to having conversation and acknowledging the shortcomings and the traumatizing impacts of the courts, um, clients respond really well to that. And they will appreciate it. Uh, they'll appreciate not just the honesty, but being given the opportunity to sort of arm themselves with a support system as they're going to go through um, what is likely to be a traumatizing process. So it sounds like it's extremely important to be scaffolding all along the way. Yeah. And I noticed, I noticed that, I'm just wondering if you can... Just give us a, a, a brief understanding of what a trauma trigger might be and how you work with clients around their trauma triggers as part of a trauma-informed legal practice. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone has different triggers, right? We, I mean, depending on what your relationship is with your client, you could say, what are your triggers? And then I can work to avoid those things. But oftentimes people don't know, particularly when they're still really deep in the like in the trauma. They haven't gotten through uh, the grieving process into healing yet. They're still deep in the trauma. And when they're there, they tend to lack any self-awareness. So they couldn't answer your question, even with their best attempt to say, oh, yeah, these are my triggers and this is what I need to feel safe. They might not be able to, to answer those questions. So all we can do is look at the ways in which we can make space for them when we meet with them. So that's that could be different things. If we're meeting in person, we could do simple things like whatever it takes to give people um, the feeling like they have some control over their participation in your process. So mm. it could be tiny oh, things yeah. like, right? It could be a tiny thing like, where where would you like me to sit? Where would you like to sit? Do you want the door open? Do you want the door closed? Do you want the lights up? Do you want them down? Would right. you like a support person present with you? Like just very simple things. And then what, what, yeah. yeah. If, and what's going to happen is the client is going to be like, oh my God, this lawyer really actually cares um, about what my experience is going to be in this. And they are really showing up to meet me where I am as opposed to demanding I meet them where they're at. Yep. And that's, yeah. that's critical. That's critical because that is going to set the groundwork for safety and empowerment, which is, you know, foundational to being trauma informed. So I noticed that you use this term or one of the authors in the toolkit uses this term universal precautions, which I really like because when I read what it meant, I, I thought that's what I tell people around, um, queer and trans and two spirit clients that you don't know who is necessarily queer or trans or two spirit. So just assume that anyone could be. And I see that's, um, do you want to explain what the universal universal precautions concept is or approach? <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to. I don't know. I don't know who wrote that piece. It could have been a lawyer or it could have been one of our mental health um, professionals. And I don't have the toolkit in front of me. But what you're describing for me is really, I would say, similar, if not in total alignment with the concept of cultural humility, which right. is you show up. And you recognize that the person that you're meeting with is the expert in their own lived experience, right? And so um, why is that important? Because we recognize that we're there to learn from them and we should not be imposing our beliefs, our judgments, or our assumptions, or our values on whoever it is we're meeting with. And we allow them to tell us 
who they are, how they experience this. So we could help to identify any risks that they might be um, confronted with or any areas of vulnerability so that we can work around those things and put safeguards in place that ensure that they are um, having as safe an experience as possible when they go through these legal processes. And so that includes when somebody says, I'm two-spirit or I'm Indigenous and I feel especially vulnerable, then we can have a meaningful conversation about what are the unique experiences specific to that person. So even me being Indigenous, I can't be like, oh, I know what you mean, because I don't know what somebody means. Even if we, we identify in multiple ways, doesn't mean we've had the same lived experience. And so as soon as I would say, oh, I know what you mean, then immediately that relationship of me being the learner and you being the expert is no more because I've decided I know what I need to know about your lived experience. You need not say more, which is offensive. Right. I love that term cultural humility. And um, in, in a sense that could mean, you know, letting someone know that you think that you might not be the best person to support them and, and then making a, a good, referral to someone who would have that container to be able to understand their lived experience more. Yes, especially because it's so connected to biases. We all have biases, right? Many of them are unconscious biases. And if some of our biases are so significant that there's no way really that we can safeguard our uh, decision making or our engagement from our biases, then hopefully we know enough to hand the file over to someone else who is not going to be influenced by bias as they go through certain processes. And we see bias all the time in um, in our various legal systems, particularly when it comes to victims of sexual violence. We see a lot of bias, stereotypes, myths, but we also see the same thing when we talk about racialized people, indigenous people, um, LGBTQ2S. Oh, yes. Right? So many stereotypes that, you know, gay men are promiscuous uh, or that, um, you know, I'm trying to think about trans people are deceptive or they're crazy, you know, and crazy in a, in, in the negative sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, totally. assuming, I mean, marginalized groups that have very, very difficult historical relationships with policing, surveillance and legal systems in particular criminal legal systems, but also like, not just provincial or federal, but municipal bylaw enforcement officers, if they're poor and they're street involved, assuming that people have done something wrong in order to have this pattern of bad experiences with polices, police or enforcement officers when, um, you know, we know that's, that's not the case. Yeah. Absolutely. The relationship with police is not the same across the board, right? And that's one aspect of, I like the whole cultural, like as I start to learn more and more about the cultural humility framework, I love it. I love it because the two women who came up with it are two black physicians from Los Angeles who after witnessing the beating of Rodney King said, what can we do to address racial inequity in our backyard and their backyard being the health profession. And they looked at and scrutinized cultural competence, which at the time, and I think even still today is one of the preferred approaches to kind of building bridges, but it really falls short because cultural competence is so self-centered and like, what do I know about you? What do what have I read? What have I been trained in to um, help me work with you as uh, someone who is very different from me? Which is so, which when you get to unconscious bias, really you need to be asking, what do I know about me, my history, the history of my community, and my people? What do I know about uh, like us? And well, and what do I know about? what are my beliefs about you and where did I get that information? And is that accurate? Is it factual? Is it ill-informed? What do I need to change about me and my mm -hmm. beliefs? And so 
Cultural humility, I love that it's focused on relationship. It's about the relationship between two people. It's about bridging misunderstandings and having courageous conversations, which I really love because that so aligns with my Indigenous, you know, my Indigenous culture and teachings. So I love it. The relational approach is the way to, to the future of this profession. Well, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is about the distinction the toolkit makes about uh, transactional lawyering and relational lawyering. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what's the difference between those two approaches. I absolutely can talk about that one because I know what that one is. Um, so, you know, relational, think about what being relational means like just that word relation right versus transaction we know what the differences are so uh, but in the terms in terms of uh client engagement transactional looks more like you know being really tight-lipped seeing only the legal issue and being very reactive being very um lacking empathy, and almost just sort of being somewhat robotic, I, and being very, very rigid in terms of time, language, engagement, etc. cetera. And, um, and I would say that approach does a lot of harm to a lot of people. I know this because I've seen it. I know it because I've done it, because that was what I was trained to do, was identify the legal issue. Like think back to law school. Remember when we had to do those, like, identify the facts and the issue the and the ratio, reasoning? The case. Right? All that came down to was the ratio. No one ever says, identify, like, the complex, like, like the, the complex vulnerabilities that these parties are experiencing. It never says, why might we need to think about that? But what I have learned what is that... Need. <laughs> in this in this scenario what scaffolding might this lawyer need in this scenario exactly so being relational moving towards being relational means that we recognize the whole person not just the legal issue and we make space for that whole person we are responsive as opposed to reactive so if somebody starts to get angry because sometimes when trauma presents it presents as anger it's not always sadness and silence sometimes it's anger and so we depersonalize that we sit back and go okay well you know we think in our minds of course, you have every right to be pissed off. I'm not going to take this personally. This is just your trauma presenting. So you might have to release that so then we can talk about the issue. And so you make space for it as opposed to going, oh, you need to like calm down. And I'm we're, maybe we're, security. I'm going to call security. Or you know what? We're going to reschedule to a date when you can get a hold of yourself, right? Like whatever. That's so whack. Anyway, I digress. So, being re relational acknowledges the whole person. It's responsive as opposed to reactive. It's patient and empathetic, and it is transparent. You say, this is this is everything behind the curtain. This is what, what is coming down the road. And I think that does so much to help people um, de-escalate any anxieties because oftentimes fears are about uncertainty like I don't know what's going to happen and some lawyers are power ego players and they love to hold that card that mystery card but I find if you tell people this is what's behind the curtain this is what's possible then they're like okay good thank you so uh, just to um in our last few minutes I want to ask you what do you think law students need to be trained on what is missing in legal education, which doesn't stop once you graduate from law school and finish articling, but in the sense of what, how, how the future lawyers are being taught, what's missing? Well, on education and trauma-informed lawyering. So what does that mean? That means that they should be taught about how trauma could present in others, in their clients, in their colleagues, and of course, in themselves. Um, they should be taught about how they can adapt their strategies to make space for the traumas of other people. What applications, given whatever practice area, what applications can they make to help minimize the traumatizing impacts that their clients might have to go through? Um, what, uh, what is vicarious trauma? 
They should know about that. They should know what puts you at risk for vicarious trauma. Which How might the legal absorb? You feel you have you have your own trauma responses because of being the person who is hearing all these first person accounts of extremely um, graphic details of terrible experiences, which, you know, most, most lawyers hear that, right. Especially in family law, criminal law. Well, I mean, okay. So that's like at the extreme end. So like the criminal lawyers, the family lawyers, you're hearing a lot of things around sex abuse or sexual violence, or maybe you're looking at images of violence, but also on the other spectrum, if you're just dealing with clients who routinely show up at your door in an emotionally distressed state, you have to navigate that. Eventually, that could impact on your own mental health and well-being. So we have to learn. We have to teach law students about what vicarious trauma is. And then how do we build resilience? How do we do it individually? How do we do it as a profession so that we can safeguard our mental health for the whole, you know, the whole time that we are in this profession so that folks are not committing suicide, getting into addictions right. um, or otherwise leaving the profession because they see actually this is not a healthy profession to be in because we know the stats, right? And they're not very good for our profession. And so that yeah, needs absolutely. to change. And this like common for lawyering especially for indigenous lawyers, uh, women in law, racialized women, queer and trans people in law, it's extra, uh, it's extra stressful and unhealthy. Thank you yeah. so much, Myrna. This has been really, really incredible. We could spend hours talking about the toolkit and about, you know, trauma informed legal practice. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have before our next guest. So thank you. I'm so grateful that you that you joined us and really encourage everybody who's watching to to look at that toolkit and do the vicarious trauma self-assessment at the very end. It's a very interesting exercise to do. And listen to the podcast, The Trauma Informed Lawyer. Thank you so much, Myrna. And now we're going to get super practical. So within the hectic under-resourced legal clinic setting, how do you actually implement these strategies for being trauma-informed and causing no further harm. We're going to hear from our next two speakers who both work in legal clinics. Our first second guest is Ruby Dand, an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at Thompson Rivers University, True. Ruby has worked as a human rights lawyer specializing in disability and mental health law. She led the development and establishment of the True Community Legal Clinic, which is the faculty's first clinical law program. At True's Faculty of Law, she teaches mental health law, health law, human rights law, clinical legal education, and community lawyering. We will also have the honor of being joined by Aruna Budram, a licensed paralegal and community legal worker practicing at the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. She has worked on multiple projects for the 2S LGBTQ community and for survivors of domestic violence and forced or cons non-consensual marriage. Aruna has been active in Indigenous sovereignty, Palestine solidarity, prison justice, abolition, and anti-racism movements for the past decade. She's also a community DJ and a queer autonomous parent of a brilliant one-year-old. So with this illustrious panel, let's get started. Hi, Ruby. Hi, Aruna. Welcome. Hi there. Hi, Hi. Welcome to our knowledge exchange. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for having us. So first of all, I'm going to ask each of you to describe your clinic, your clinic or the setup of your clinic with a focus on what kinds of clients you see and what kinds of traumas uh, may be present. So Aruna, maybe you can get us started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so at Salco, we have we provide um, legal services, uh, free legal services to um, low income South Asians across the GTA, and then also um, uh, Ontario. Um, we do law reform, we do all kinds of different things. But in particular, um, for clients, we provide um, 
any kind of uh, legal support, uh, representation, advice, um, and referrals around issues um, and legal issues in particular around um, immigration, housing, mm -hmm. um, social assistance, appeals, um, and a variety of other things that a lot of um, a lot of folks who are living in low income situations are dealing with, um, including also domestic violence. And we also have been doing a lot of work on um, folks who are um, experiencing forced marriage um, and non-consensual marriage. Great. And I'm just going to follow up before we go to Ruby. What kind of, what would you say might be specific to intersectional two-spirit QT BIPOC traumas? Like what are some of your observations uh, from SALCO? Um, I mean, everything that's happening to all communities, especially racialized communities, um, there's there's always going to be two S LGBTQ people involved, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, I think the the intersectional ex inter intersectionality that comes with being both, for example, a queer person of color or a queer black person, a queer trans uh, and black and potentially mm -hmm. indigenous person, all the things that come with that um, is stuff that we have uh, seen at Salco and also in the community legal clinic system. Um, when you have a population that is dealing with um, poverty, but also dealing with xenophobia, also dealing with precarious immigration status, yeah. um, that is also dealing with house and secu housing insecurity um, and all the things that come with um, the way that the system is set up against um, folks who are living on social assistance, um, all those things impact, of course, um, uh, LGBTQ people triple fold, right? Um, including the homophobia that comes with, with that as well and transphobia. And would you say, you know, Myrna had talked about and the toolkit that we, we looked at talks about different kinds of trauma, like the single instance, single instance traumatic in event, uh, then also the um, repetitive instances of trauma and then complex trauma where we, you know, I'm sure we've all seen clients where their whole lives have been uh constructed with or infiltrated, impacted by uh, traumas that are intergenerational and really uh, intense and repetitive. So I'm just wondering if you see those different kinds uh, at Salco. Yeah, so our clients, you know, come with uh, many layers um, of trauma and of all kinds of experience and, and harm, right, from either both systemically, institutionally, and then um, intergenerationally and then also um, for, like currently. <laughs> so it's not just a, a historical uh, point of trauma, but also a current situation. So um, for our clients, they're dealing with, you know, being a single parent um, on with on low, low income or no income, mm -hmm. on attempting to get social assistance, but then also having to deal with CAS and also having to deal with potential family issues. And then also having to come to terms with, you know, um, the, the system in front of them that doesn't actually provide what they need. Um, and so our clients are, are consistently having to navigate as, um, this, the structures um, that unfortunately don't provide them with um, support um, in the ways that they need. Um, and so I guess for, for, for LGBTQ2S folks that come into our, our, our clinic, um, a lot of time it's not just um, that piece, right? So if we're looking at it through an intersectional lens and also what Myrna was talking about is thinking about it, how we incorporate a trauma-informed understanding of their experience is thinking about how we are approaching um, the the seen and unseen parts of them, right? Um, that they might not share with us at first, but are always actively happening. Um, so that's really important for our clients as well as knowing that they, they might be coming in for one issue, but there's also lots of other things happening that we don't know about. Yeah. And that will inform how they, what they want and what outcomes work for them for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ruby, could you talk about your clinic and the setup of your clinic and clients and what kinds of trauma you've observed present and how? Big question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I'm here in Kamloops and I am here working on the First Nations territory belonging to the Tecumloops to Shaquemek people. And 
it, here in Kamloops, we opened up our TRU Community Legal Clinic, which is in conjunction with our TRU Faculty of Law, only in February 2016. So we're a relatively new clinic, and I was involved in kind of developing the clinic and putting forth the model and applying for funding and so on. And that whole process in itself, um, with collaboration with the community took about four years. So, so that process, so long. well, um, I arrived here in 2012. And one of the reasons that I did come to join the faculty was to be part of developing the legal clinic here. Um, and really, we have such a dearth of legal services. So we're the first, uh, you know, staff led, like student led, legal clinic in the interior there really isn't there wasn't anything else when when I came when I moved here in 2012 um and obviously moving here from Toronto so listening to Aruna talk about Salco um and having worked in the legal clinic system in Ontario it was kind of eye-opening because uh, there hasn't you know there we lost our legal aid office here in Kamloops you know for about approximately 20 years before, yeah. and our legal services are severely curtailed here in BC, and just being aware that we're in the interior, really away from larger centers like Vancouver, um, and, and really understanding what the community needs are so that process in itself the collaboration doing we did a lot of I applied for funding to do empirical work um, with specifically looking at what are the community needs and really hearing the voices of two as trans and queer folks and and their barriers to accessing justice mm -hmm. because of the lack of legal services um, and because of our location and really understanding what their role in advocacy is and how how what they wanted this legal clinic to look like so thinking about huge themes around like how can we increase access to justice using trauma-informed practices how could we also kind of match client and community needs and looking at models of clinical legal education also because this is uh, a legal clinic that is, is student run. So it's part of our clinical legal education program at the Faculty of Law. And, and also thinking about how are we gonna get funding? So that whole process in itself was a challenge. Um, yeah. and we opened our doors in February, 2016. And I wanna ask you, what are some of the challenges of implementing a trauma-informed approach when you're working with a student run legal clinic? That's a great question. How is it different than working with in a regular clinic setting where the students are not the caseworkers? Absolutely. I think it's really ensuring that there are a lot of opportunities for dialogue and conversation specifically around um, for them to understand what does it mean to be trauma informed for them to actually talk about like unconscious bias and being able to unpack issues and understand barriers that equity seeking communities are experiencing because some of our students may not have been exposed to that um, and they they may not have those understandings and so it is a very different kind of layer of complexity because again those are the, the students are the ones who are doing the intake. They're doing the interview. They're the ones who are going to be getting back to the client, establishing that relationship and for them to really understand, okay, how are clients actually experiencing trauma? So how uh, might we as law students and caseworkers actually increase their trauma or add to it, right? Or, or <coughs> because I mean, I've heard so many people from, LGBTQI2S communities tell me their horrible experiences uh, with lawyers. With lawyers in all facets of the legal system, I'm not going to make words there. So. Absolutely. And I, it is a huge challenge. So that was another part of the process was really ensuring that um, I had to go through and develop a course. That's why I teach the course called Community Lawyering. That is that is a prerequisite and a co-requisite for any student who wants to be involved in the community legal clinic so that 
they have those conversations and we're doing a lot of reading. We're reading Myrna's work. We're talking about various clinical models across the country. Um, we're drawing from the expertise and bringing forth speakers who have their own lived experience, right? And we're really in, in even as the clinic is even evolving, because again, we're kind of, re we're identifying new priorities every day. And that's part of the process also of seeing, okay, how, how are we still needing to respond to the community? I think even during the pandemic, we've recognized there's new areas and new barriers to accessing justice. Um, we are hearing a lot from the trans and 2S and queer community about their experiences of trauma in the interior and how, some, how our clinic needs to respond to that. So really understanding like barriers to accessing justice and also understanding our limitations because we are limited in what we can offer. So we do offer legal services in residency tenancy, employment standards, small claims, human rights issues before the human rights tribunal and some criminal charges and some simple wills and so on. But we are really limited, for instance, in the areas of family law. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of it's very underfunded and also recognizing that we're very limited in even um, for people who need accommodation needs met and so on in a unionized environment, we are not able to do those areas. We're limited in criminal law, right? There's so much um, homophobia and issues that you know our communities are so vulnerable during any contact of the law but especially in the criminal justice system so <laughs> and it seems like you know coming back to that concept of cultural humility that Myrna talked about you know knowing when you don't know things and knowing when um, you need to refer to other people who have the skills, the knowledge, the lived experience. And I think there's also a legal humility there that, I mean, is not part of our training as lawyers at all, um, nor is introspection or understanding of our own, you know, traumas, right? Which if you listen to the Trauma Informed Lawyer podcast, she has an episode, Myrna has an episode of where Gabra Mate is talking about his experience of being triggered as an expert witness and how it sh it, sh it influenced how he gave his testimony in a really negative way because he hadn't been prepared for himself to be triggered mm -hmm. as an expert witness. And he's an expert on trauma, but I digress. So let's jump into these practical approaches. And uh, we were gonna talk about intakes, interviewing, and how to... <coughs> practice in a trauma-informed way when in court before tribunals or in mediation or like formal legal settings. So let's start with an intake. Um, Aruna, do you want to field that one? Like how, what do you, what do you consider um, before the intake, during the intake, follow-up? Um, so I think for intake, it's, it's really important considering it's, you know, the initial time of meeting a client. Um, Obviously, the way that uh, we talk about well, the way that we do it at Salco anyways, is that we get information first about uh, a client. So just very basic information. This might be what they're talking about. It's kind of the area of law that we're looking at. Um, and then that's given to us. And then we have an opportunity to connect with the client and then bring them in for an interview or for uh, um, for our initial interview. Um, <clears throat> I've noticed that also with with a lot of clients, especially um of folks who are from having intersectional um, experiences of oppression or trauma, um, legal legal community, legal people, people with authority um, in that way is is can be very hard, right? Right. Um, and so, so it's yeah, and as, and as much as folks in legal clinics are like, well, but I'm the good guy, I'm here to help you, um, it's very important for us to think about the power dynamics that already exist in the initial conversation. Um, and it's of, personal. Pardon? It's not personal. It like, is not personal. When someone is triggered by you, it's not personal. It's not personal. It's and I think, really, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that, that kind of like egotistical, this ego-based um, organizing or work that happens often with the, the savior complex that a lot of times comes with folks who are working in, um, particularly in clinic settings, um, can be very problematic and also really uh, stifle the ability to actually create a, a true rapport with your client. Um, 
And I think what happens, it, what can happen is the ways that you connect at in the initial place with the, with their client in the interviews is, is crucial. Um, so, cause that also means that your, your client might not feel comfortable talking to you about particular things. There might be information that they need to give you that they don't feel like they can. Right. Um, so yeah, in terms of unconscious bias, um, it's really important to be able to consistently be checking yourself throughout that. Um, I love, I love what Myrna talked about in terms of cultural humility and, and knowing that you don't know everything. Um, I find this a lot with um, with lawyers and then also, I mean, I haven't really worked much with other paralegals, but I'm sure it's with paralegals as well around um, thinking about thinking about your client as like the person that you were there to assist as opposed to them being the expert in their own experience. Um, and I really do think that it's really important to think about, you know, I'm not going to ever assume for an ODSP client that I understand the pain that is they're experiencing in their body, right? Um, when I'm doing an appeal for ODSP um, application, or if um, they're ex they're telling me or um, the the deep trauma that they felt around um, coming here from a, a war torn country and now mm -hmm. having to claim refugee status, I obviously have no idea what that feels like. Um, and it's important for me to to not assume that one case is just like every other case. Just because I see lots of folks from the Tamil community does not mean that every Tamil person that I meet that comes in through my door has the same experience. Right. Um, well, not, I, flattening, not flattening based on past experiences with other clients. Exactly. Yeah. We can see trends, of course, but of course, there's so many different ways that people experience very similar things. Right. And so... Um, I, I want to ask you, sorry, I want to ask you about, this is very practical and I think people really struggle with this, timing, how much time, given mm. you have so little time and so many clients yeah. at clinics, how do you deal with the lack of time? And also, do you consider anything about the physical space or even what you wear or I'm not sure? Yeah, it's interesting because the wearing the what you wear thing is really, really relative and, and it can be a hit or miss because I really am bad at dressing up and I'm not really good at it at all. And I usually the one that's work, walking in with like political T-shirts um, every day as I'm like wearing right now. Um, <laughs> and so it's and it's difficult, right, because some clients, they expect you to look a particular way. Right. Um, and especially, you know, folks from, di from different countries have a very particular idea around class when it comes to like lawyers and yeah. folks in authority, right? So it's like, do you want to play into that? Or do you want to also be like, actually, I'm just a regular person and I want to support you in, in, in this process that you're going through. So I can't, I don't really know. It really is, is a, it's a hard thing um, to navigate. I would say that no matter what you're wearing, I think that um, you, it's really important to not, uh, it's, it's what Myrna said, and I really appreciated what she said around thinking through how you even are accessing the space with the person. So asking questions like the door thing, uh, opening door, keeping a door uh, closed. Um, in terms of folks who have also experienced domestic violence, and if you're, if the worker is a, is a male worker with, um, with, with, female identified um, people or people who have experienced uh, domestic violence from um, a male identified person, that could be really traumatic, right? Um, so having a closed door situation with a male lawyer could be right. an issue, right? right? So asking also is the, asking like, is it okay that this that you're gonna be in a closed room with a person of this gender or this identity? Does this feel comfortable for you? Does this feel safe? Um, bring in breaks, like maybe they need a cigarette break. Maybe they need exactly. to get around yeah in between like halfway through like a one hour interview yeah and also you know I, I work with a lot of folks who also have, like live with chronic pain right and chronic pain because of the trauma they've experienced um, many times and so thinking about um the ways in which they even are able to, do you have comfortable chairs um do you have a different variety of chairs in your office that will allow for them to walk around or or get up easily um are you asking them to sit and wait in your waiting room for 25 to 30 minutes when they actually have a hard time sitting for that long. Right. So well, these um, are the things you'd ask ahead of time before the intake. Exactly. Before they come in so that they're prepared also, because not knowing seems to cause a lot of anxiety and stress for 
people For sure. who have, like who have experienced trauma. Um, I think I'm going to ask now, Ruby, thank you so much, Aruna. That was a jam packed with information and so useful. Um, Ruby, do you want to talk about like interviewing skills and actually how you ask questions? Because lawyers are so focused on getting the information that they think that they need quickly. But can you break that down for us? Absolutely. So, and even kind of reflecting on what Aruna um, has been sharing with us, which is fantastic. And I think it's really important, especially for me as a professor kind of teaching law students and talking about these issues is for them to really be aware of, of you know, the types of trauma or even that trauma is can exist, right? So, as I mentioned that the fact of being aware and really then understanding um, the range of various types of interview techniques that can be used. So um, ensuring that our, our intake and our interview is really kind of fostering more of a dialogue and that students are aware of their own biases and they're able to kind of create as Myrna mentioned, more of like this relational practice where they can really hear the stories meaningfully of clients. They can hear those stories without judgment, that they feel like they are in a safe place where they can share that historic and current trauma, but they mm -hmm. can also clarify what those needs may be. So there has been many opportunities where we've seen that some students actually need to kind of re-interview or ask various other questions. Um, the interview process may take longer and yeah. that there is more opportunities for, um, you know, the students and even the supervising lawyer to kind of engage with the client and also be self-aware, but then to also be able to debrief around it. Um, and I think in terms of one thing I wanted to mention too, I know Aruna mentioned this. so. It's also important for us to recognize that we do have a lot of clients who are experiencing various types of barriers and they also experience perhaps some types of disability and so on. So for them to really be aware that there might be other kind of accommodation needs even throughout the interview process in terms of interpretation or ASL interpretation or just in terms of access, right? Note and taking, Note taking is a big one for a lot of um, clients that I've worked with where they need to have notes, they would like to have a copy of notes, like so they can remember things, um, which they would, you know, because trauma has a huge impact on attention and memory, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right? And really just being really clear and concise, because as we know, even a lot of clients don't even know kind of what area of law the challenge is within or the issue is right. within. And 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 the, the legal system is so complicated, right? And there's there's a lot of anxiety around that. So just ensuring that, you know, the individual really feels like they're being heard, but also that it's not like, okay, you have to go to court next week. This is what it entails. So really kind of stepping back and saying, hey, this is how it might impact you. This is what it's going to look like. And going about maybe, it in a way. Maybe making a flow chart, you know, maybe visually mapping what the steps are and the different like uh, options or alternatives so that they can actually leave with a sense of knowing where it's all going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The flowchart is fantastic, right? And and really kind of simplifying this kind of complex, sometimes legal information, right? And, and another thing I wanted to mention is I think it's really important when we think about the language that we use in law, because it can be really problematic. So as we know, um, you know, it, there's so many terms that are really problematic, even the term, for instance, disability can be uh, kind of daunting to a number of people or, or not as some, sometimes comes across as offensive for some who, who wouldn't recognize that they do have a disability but explaining that we have to use those terms in the legal sense because of the charter because of human rights codes and just clarifying with your client that um, you understand these terms are socially constructed and can be really problematic so That's for a lot of trans cases where they're forced to construe their transness as a disability in order to access mm -hmm. care for sure. Absolutely. And recognizing that it's paternal and, you know, all of the problems with that. So I think it's, it's really important to have, 
explain that in that interview process because you sometimes uh, may have a document or you may have a particular case that you're pursuing and you have to refer to a piece of legislation and there's a term there that you know can be really offensive and problematic. So I think um, that in itself through the, the interview process can really ensure that it's a more meaningful process and that this deep listening kind of does occur. Um, and just being able to like take breaks and also like ensuring that our students are able to recognize their own body language and so on um, and even their facial expressions because sometimes you know, all of us can have facial expressions that we don't even expect that we're going to have. And so just ensuring that they're aware of that, I think is really important. And debriefing after is something that we've tried to do throughout um, our clinical process and throughout after the interview with students, because some of them may be experiencing their own triggers and vicarious traumatization. Thank you. That is really, really solid. And so, I mean, I will say certainly didn't experience that kind of support in my legal training, but definitely do that with my students because, you know, we know, we know how many law students and then lawyers are experiencing, you know, addictions, depression, insomnia, like all kinds of things that are related to both trauma and then just work stress. Um, let's very quickly, because we're running out of time, move to some practical approaches for courtroom, tribunal, mediation settings where, for example, the courtroom staff or the mediator might be misgendering your client or repeatedly using words that you know are traumatic for your client uh, or are triggers. So what kind of things can can lawyers do? At Salco, it's, and for my own practice as well, I think it's really important for, um, and also in my personal politic around that is to is to call that out, obviously, um, as an obvious one. I think that sometimes in legal settings and especially at tribunals and in court situations, that hierarchy and that power dynamic is very um, is very strong in terms of we need to you know show respect to the judge and there's a very, very like very particular ways of of demeanor and um, of interaction that. Um, that doesn't allow often, often doesn't allow for us to challenge these kinds of things that are actually very harmful to our clients. Um, I think that um, we need to be accomplices to our clients instead of just allies. And I think that that's really important for my own practice around, you know what, I might piss off a judge or I might piss off a, a member at a tribunal by asking them to consistently use the right pronouns, but that is going to be incredibly important for my client and for my own practice and for my own values um, in terms of creating an access to justice that is that is true to their to my client's needs. Um, and that's what comes first for me. Right. And so is it possible to like ahead of time, let the tribunal know, because we often, you know, we're always like emailing and writing to the tribunals before hearings or mediations and say, so this is the person's legal name. If you have to do some sort of identification, fine. But then after that, this is the name they use. These are their pronouns. This is what we're doing. I mean, you, what do you think? Yeah. So in uh, this, I, I can speak specifically to um, the like an ODSP tribunal um, as one of them that we do a lot at Salco is um, there's also preliminary issues and preliminary things that we would like to bring up. And that's usually what mm -hmm. I'm like. Just an FYI, this is what's happening. And I've written this in, in all the paperwork that I've sent. We usually um, have already written many, as you as you were saying, I've already written many times to um, to uh, ODSP and also to the tribunal members. So they already have all that information um, in my um, in the things that I've sent. So um, in prelim issues, I usually just am like, okay, so also just a reminder of this. And so if moving forward, we can make sure that this is the name we're using um, and then also the, pro the pronouns that we're going to be using yeah um yeah, yeah so i think that um laying that out beforehand is really important um also explaining to the client um that while i will be consistently trying to support that in in making sure that happens um there will be people who unfortunately won't understand that and that is not reflective of them or or the work that we want to do together or the way that i want to do things but we are working in a system that unfortunately 
isn't anti-oppressive and anti-colonial. You know, we are working in a very particularly um, hard system to be in. So I guess just for also for our clients, and we do this whether or not that this is around pronouns or around expectations, right, is laying out the expectations that um, that you should have or you could have going into this. And also I always say prepare um, prepare for the worst, but hope for the yeah. best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and that means also in terms of triggers, right? In terms of trauma and triggers, they're going to, especially for ODSP clients. I mean, I don't know if anyone that's watching has done ODSP tribunals, but um, they literally ask clients to like outline devastating details about their personal experience of pain, literal pain, right? So it's it's incredibly traumatizing, right? For someone who has who has seen their life go by them and then now are in a place where because of the things that have happened to them in their life because of poverty and war and all the things um, are now in a place where they have to sit in front of this usually white person and explain in a different language why they need the very menial amounts of money that the government is trying to like fight them on you know um it's a very um it's uh, yeah it's so dehumanizing pretty. right and these these places like these tribunals and these courtrooms are incredibly dehumanizing for especially for our clients right it's where people's children are taken away it's where people are sent to jail this is not they're not safe places they're safe places of of fear and and a lot of violence right so um one thing i'm going to add to is i often ask clients what would you like me to do if people misgender you so i'll tell them i've taken these steps to try to make sure that the presiding member um knows but if this happens would you like me to correct totally fine to do that would you like me to just let it go and then continue to use the pronouns that you want like how do you want me to handle it because yeah. not all clients want you to make a big deal about it because they are not comfortable mm -hmm. with it right so i'm yeah. really important but the client might not be comfortable with it in that formal setting and that's the that's the bias there, right? Like, I think that's also this weird thing that a lot of folks think that, well, if someone has disclosed to me that they're queer or trans, that must be the most important thing, right? And for a lot of racialized people, sometimes it's not, right? And I think we have to also check ourselves in terms of assumptions around how people want to also express that part of themselves. Totally. Um, I also often say this for my own queerness, that is one piece of me, right? Um, I'm also a Caribbean person. I'm also... Um, a lot of other things, right? And that also determines how I, how I access spaces and how I don't access spaces in particular ways. So yeah. yeah, I think checking your own assumptions and biases around how people are wanting to identify, um, depending on where they are, they might feel more comfortable to say that with you than they would with a, a member at a tribunal or a judge. Yeah. yeah. Ruby, would you like to add to that in our last moments of our, <laughs> of our <laughs> here, which I just don't want it to end because it's so interesting. Absolutely. And I think the the one thing I can think about is I know that a lot of this conversation and dialogue needs to happen. I feel like in terms of having more uh, legal education and having more dialogue, even with judges and adjudicators and with our local bar. So yeah. Here at TRU, we've we've been honored to have a, like a trans competent workshops, right? By uh, Professor Sam Singer, who uh, was our wonderful colleague and is now at University of Ottawa. But having workshops like that that includes uh, lawyers and judges and all of our students, I think, is fantastic. And having also TRC days um, featuring speakers like Myrna has been fantastic for learning and continuing the dialogue in collaboration with our judges and adjudicators and our local bar and our students. So I hope that we can see more kind of initiatives like that and more law reform and dialogue about these issues moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And we will be sharing some of the resources like Sam Singer's chapter on trans competent lawyering um, on our website. And hopefully we'll have a banner in a second. There it is. So I want to take a moment to say thank you so much to Ruby and Aruna for this, like, this is the stuff we need to be learning. This is the stuff we need to be talking about in a lot more detail than we did today. But I'm so impressed and grateful that you have packed, both of you packed so much detail and practical tools into 
uh, your presentations today. So thank you so much. And please join us for episode three, where, which will air on March 11th where we get into substantive legal material. So our topic is common legal issues for LGBTQI2S clients. We'll be featuring criminal defense lawyer, Promise Holmes Skinner, and family and health law practitioner, Laurel Harris, and also the paralegal, Audrey Huntley from No More Silence. And remember, stay safe, wear a mask, support your communities. Bye.